Hello everybody, I'm Jesus Fernandez, as you can see in the slide. I'm here to present my contribution to Qt. It's uh, OAuth support for Qt 5.8. Okay. What's OAuth? Uh, as you can, mo most of you, I'm pretty sure that you know, it's an open standard for authorization to avoid the users to uh, give the application our credentials. Instead of that, we rely on uh, for example, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, whatever, uh, the authorization and the credential of the staff. There are two different protocols based on OAuth. is OAuth 1 and OAuth 2. Uh, my class is my new model implements OAuth 1 and OAuth 2 separately. Uh, the main point of using OAuth is uh, it gives us an, a security layer over our application, could be in a, in a web server or in a client application that is not really thought to be, but it's allowed. Uh, the main point is uh, when we have this uh, uh, a server and we can, we need to connect it to it to receive some information from it. We can use uh, an application that simply uh, ask for the username and pass password, and we should trust on this application. Who knows, maybe it's uh, storing the, the username and password and encrypted on the disk, send it to internet or whatever. Instead of that, with OAuth, uh, we can rely on, for example, a, a Twitter authentication web that has a certificate or and everything, and I, th I consider that is more reliable than <laughs> than the other example. I can show you a, f a small example about how to use uh, this new, new set of classes. There is a a out object that encapsulates everything, client identifiers, secrets, uh, tokens, everything. Also, uh, it creates a, a HTTP server to be able to receive the callback, because one of the most important uh, stuff that OAuth as a standard provides is the, the way to, that communicates with, the, with our application in the web server or in, in our client. We need to receive this, the tokens that provides us the, okay, you are authorized to use this information in, a, in some way. This is what we see. Here in this tokens. These are the tokens, and this allows us to make authenticated requests to the server. OK. I have a small example of Twitter. You see that uh, we need to configure some, some URLs to make the request, because in OAuth 1, we have temporary tokens and uh, tokens that are use it to make these authenticated requests, and the temporary tokens are used to get uh, these tokens. So let's try it. The application starts. It's in a standby. And uh, we can see the, this login from, from the slide. I simply, OK, I can confirm that my, the permissions that ask are okay, so I simply authorize that. If I not, uh, if have not auto, uh, credentials stored in my web browser, in this case Edge, I should uh, write my username and password. Okay, let's authorize it. Okay, redirecting. And this is information received from the local web server that re received the token. We can see it here. So in our application, we received the, the token, so we can receive the our timeline, in, in this case, my user timeline. OK, uh, these classes will be part of the, this new model in uh, QT 5.8. It's called QNetwork Out. Uh, in the future, we will add 
more, more standards to the, this library. But uh, this moment is a technology preview, so it could fail, uh, could be improved, could change everything. Um, if you feel that you are able to contribute, I appreciate any help. You, uh, with uh, new protocols, uh, wrappers for, for example, Google services, whatever. If you need something, you can reach me these addresses. Thank you. Second. Let's see if this library can be extended to in the How do I do this then? Oh there we are. There we are. Uh, my talk is about design. Uh, my name is Dan Sarit Bay, and I've been I do design for KDE with the KDE Visual Design Group or the Design Group. Uh, maybe mainly working on Plasma, but also different applications. And I've done this talk several times. This is an old talk, like simple rules to improve your UI design. How many here have done, tried to do a UI? Or do, ever done anything graphical? How many here does it professionally, like work with it? There's one, you don't have to stay. Uh, you can go. <laughs> Uh, okay, so my talk is design dummy. It's, it's essentially 10 easy rules to improve all your designs. If you're not, sort of used to doing design. This is this might be helpful. You might, you know, just fall asleep. It's fine, it's fine. Okay, so we have design dummy. That's the title. And here we are. The first rule is sunsets is filled with color, all caused by pollutants. Don't be a sunset. Colors are indicates not flare. The point with this is one of the things I often see is that colors are used as some sort of, oh I just add a splash of color, which is horrible. Always try to stick with gray, black, white, and variations thereof until you have to, until it actually makes sense. For example, red color is a good indicator of something dangerous because we all see it. But when you start filling in color, this is what happens. Well, extreme examples. There'll be a lot of these because this is a lightning talk. This is not a longer thing, okay? Uh, it's this thing. You see this first or this? Font weight, placement, and size define what the user will look first, you idiot. This will continue, by the way. This is the theme of the thing. Uh, it's essentially the importance of actually placing things correctly, actually thinking of which is the biggest text, because your user will always see the biggest text first. It will also see things like if it's bright red, it'll notice that, but that's the previous slide. This is more or less about placing things correctly on a screen. Then you have spacing. A lot of people complain, I'm, I'm from KDE, so a lot of people complain about our increased spacing. They usually go, no, you, it, it, it takes too up to, uh, takes too much space. It's so annoying. It's like there's empty space everywhere. And it's not empty space. It's placement. It's borders. Space is a thing. It's a border of something around something else. By squeezing things together, you tell them that they belong together. By tearing them apart, you're essentially saying these are two separate things to your user. This is the most important thing in the whole slide, because a lot of technically added people ignore the human interface guidelines, the design guidelines, all these things, and people have written them for a reason. Unified design is the step one in all design projects. You have to start with unification. It has to behave and act the same and look the same, at least feel the same, so that the user doesn't get, have to relearn every little part of your application. Then we have this thing, which is also important to me, which means essentially removing as much as possible. A lot of people always think, oh, it's gonna, we're going to have settings for this and settings for this, and that's common in KDE specifically, where I'm from, but it, it's not needed. You don't have to have that many settings. People won't use it. Really consider what you're adding. Remove everything and then reconsider, because yes, options are cool, but they can't be displayed at the same time like some massive space shuttle. It doesn't work. People don't like that. Animations. I have once said, and I will say it again, people who use animations too much should be rounded up and shot. And I stick to that because I hate animations. If an animation doesn't bring a specific set of information to the user, leave it. Don't have flashy things. Don't have things flying over the screen. It's just nauseating. Even Google does this wrong at times. They just add animation because it looks cool, and that's not a reason enough. 
Wow, I sound angry. I'm sorry, it's because I'm hurrying up, okay? Then we have this thing. I don't know if you can do this, but essentially the sign is about information. It's about delivering information to your user and making sure that the user understand it, understand it correctly. And when you don't consider the placement of what you're trying to say and try to sort of move the user, plan how the user will move through your application, then you're ruining it. It's not going to work if you don't do that. And, well, I'm not going to try to read that one, but essentially it's your fault if they mess it up. Don't copy, create your own, which is fairly common as well. And that's cool. It's cool to copy at first, but please don't. Try to uh, invent something new and fun. It doesn't have to be the most craziest thing ever. And if you don't, you don't feel like doing it, ask someone. There's a large group of people at this convention. I'm sure you know a lot of people other, uh, elsewhere as well. So just ask around. It's going to be awesome. You're going to work together and everyone will be happy. Huh. Okay. Study rules. Learn how to break them, handsome. Uh, which is is the point that you, you kind of have to look at design guidelines, you have to kind of look at design blogs, but you can cheat, it's fine. Everyone who studied design did cheat. We, we all of us, like that's, that's just the truth. So just check Wikipedia or something and just try to follow that, that's fine. And then just learn it so you know how to break it properly. It's the same with human interface guidelines. Human interface guidelines are written by human, therefore, therefore they're sort of lost. They don't make sense completely. So try to break the rules a little bit. And this is the last one, which is messed up. Again, this is a Google product that messed up the placement. So it's not us. We can feel proud about that because when Google mess up, it's okay for the rest of us. Courage is more important than aptitude. And this is the second most important. It means that you have to try. There's a lot of, the reason I usually keep these talks is because a lot of developers always go like, oh, I can't do this. I don't have design in my head or whatever they use. Nonsense. Everyone knows design because you use, use it constantly. And the point is that courage is always more important than aptitude. Courage, as a, for example, a brave idiot will always be more useful to everyone else than a really, really, really smart coward. A brave idiot would either succeed and learn something or fail and die. A coward will always sit and do nothing. And that's the point. Like, as developers, you should do it yourself. It's fine. No, people will say, oh, that's not good. Like, Reddit will be shock full with people telling you you suck. And that's fine. We're used to that. We're all used to that. And ask people. Ask designers. There's the, within K if you're in KDE, it's the visual design group. Just talk to any one of us. And we will help. It'll take some time. It'll be a bit of well, we <clears throat> weird trip. But it's going to be fine. And that's the summation of everything I had to say. I just want to move. This is still the most important. Thank you. Hey, hello, everybody. We are from Wiki to Learn. We are pleased. And hi, Matteo, here's Ricardo, and now we are going to present you what we have done so far in this month and uh, what are our future plans, if your laptop wants to. If his laptop doesn't want. Ah, it's plugged in. Just... It says it's enabled, but... Do some little magic first. Yeah. No, then switch. Okay, magic. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, good. So, I want, we wanted to present a little bit of uh, what we have done in this year as wiki to learn because we felt that we have done really a lot of things and many times we fail to communicate it properly. Uh, so, this is uh, one of the ways we're trying to catch up with the whole community. So, how many of you have been here at Academy 2015? Well, not that many people, but... So, in 2015, it was when Wiki2Learn was announced, and at that time, uh, in the picture, you can see almost the half, exactly half of the team of Wiki2Learn at that time. Uh, it was great. We, we had a lot of reception of good, of good feedback and many, many good suggestions from the KD community, but it was really very much in paper. 
Until when? Until September, which is when we got our first community. Some of, of the members of this community are here right now. Uh, and we got funding from KDEV to go to a house in the mountains and lock ourselves up for four days and come up with what would be the first wiki to learn release. Very few content, very buggy, a lot of confusion, but still, it was our first version. And that way we could manage to start to speak to students and to professors about it. And that's how we got, in between October and December, our first academical partnerships. We went to these universities that decided to join. They decided, one of them even had an official wiki course, which means they had a course where the official book for the course would be on Wikitutor. And in particular, you could see there is two university and another entity, which might look mysterious, but it's uh, uh, the national, uh, the national, um, the network for research and education, which provided us with the servers so that we can run wiki to learn and not just a tiny amount. They want us to grow big. They gave us a lot of computer power. They gave us machines in three data centers with 250 CPUs, uh, terabit connection. So we're, we're really thankful for them for that. And this has given some impact. This is actually not from now, this is from, from March. It's quite hard to, to count contributors. Uh, but all this activity has proven to be beneficial and we're trying to build and we're building a, quite a healthy community. At least the, the trend seems, seems nice. Uh, what did we do after, in March, after with all this community? We had a way larger sprint. Where? At CERN. I'm adding this picture so that I hope you're ambitious so that then you can decide to be a wiki to learn contributor and join all these sort of cool events. And it was very nice because uh, CERN also participates with the Hub Software Foundation with wiki to learn and so they, they gave us a building so that we could hack for one week, day and night, and train ourselves and, and make things even more awesome. Still in a timeline, uh, one of the last things we did was to file an H2020 proposals for which we still don't know the outcome. It's, as an, obviously in H2020 proposals, it's not very likely that it will pass, but we hope it will. But the more important thing is that we got 20 of the best uh, educational institutions to sign an agreement and to actively work in wiki to learn regardless of the outcome of the proposal. And last, but, well, not last, but not least, but still one of the last points is we participated in GSOC with one of the largest uh, organizations in, within KDE, one of the largest projects within KDE uh, for the number of slots to have all sorts of improvements you can read about. You probably, you might have seen some of the blogs, writing offline editing and many improvements to the Media Wiki Editor. So you can just bring your laptop to class and take notes there. And input, let's, this is last but not least for this report is content. So how much content do we actually generate, which is the most important part, because at the end you can, you can build a great community, but if you, don't, if you want to make books that you don't have books, that's, that's a problem. So this is numbers for the Italian language, which was the first one which really started. And we managed to create about 800 chapters, more, it's like 850 right now. Uh, and we actually count on arriving on more than a thousand by the end of the week because most of the material is already there, has already been contributed, but it's just not uploaded yet because of some, of some issues. To give you a comparison, I took the Italian Wikiversity, which is probably the largest project, which does something similar to what we do. And they have 10 years of history and they could do 2,800 chapters, almost 2,800. So this was the report, but of course we got many more exciting things to say, but I will let the plans for the future to Matteo. Thank you. And what about the future? For the future, we don't want big things. We just want to conquer the, to conquer the world, to dominate the world. Okay. First of all, so far we could learn has been uh, an uh, experimental project. We tried to figure out what was going on well and what, which problems did we have. After figuring it out, we have decided to release by September the 30th, so by the end of this month, we could learn 1.0. This will be as someone would say, the best wiki to learn yet. It will be the, the production wiki to learn, so we are trying to move from experimentation to production ready. 
we are trying not to make the user need any more code, but to have everything, operations, have uh, their own user interfaces. For what concerns, for what concerns uh, community building and participation, during our sprint at CERN, we have decided uh, to launch this operation, which is called Operation 1000, which aim is to create, uh, by the next year, a community of 1,000 contributors. To do so, we have launched uh, local hives, local groups of uh, wicked learners, and we are planning to launch uh, pilot hives in Milan, Goa, and Barcelona, and a few more cities, and maybe your city can be in these local hives, in these pilot hives to create new communities and to expand our participation all around the world. For what concerns academic uh, participation and academic contributions, we have uh, created also thanks to the H2020, um, Horizon 2020 project, a uh, list of more or less 25, 30 institutions that are collaborating with us. Here you can see a few of them, and uh, on our meta page you can see all the list of academic contributions. We are trying to create academic and research network of high quality to get, you know, to expand the to learn all around the world. So far, I've talked about a few of the things we have done, but a uh, lot of things uh, due to this uh, few time are not um, allowed to be told. So you can see here more of uh, our faces. All around there, you can see other wicked learners. And uh, we are here at the Academy and uh, QtCon, and we are willing to collaborate with you, to share your opinions, uh, to talk with you. So please contact us uh, and talk about us. We have uh, also a buff on Tuesday um, at uh, 12.30, and uh, you can find more information about our communication channels at join.wikitolearn.org. And so I hope that you will join our battle. Thank you. I'll take the no 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 the um HDMI. Uh, just but wait wait let me um open it up first. Excuse me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, post books. 
Are there any uh, tax collectors in the room? Um, so who, who doesn't need money? Who, who thinks money is the root of all evil? No? So, okay. so everyone else uses money for something in their life or in their work. Um, we're going to talk about um, Postbooks, which is an accounting application, and there are, there are many other free accounting applications for Linux as well. Um, basically, Accounting software helps you go from this to this. Um, so tidying it all up um, into neat piles, making it easier to organize. Who already uses a, a double entry accounting system uh, for their personal finances or, or self-employment? Put your hands up if you are familiar with this. Uh, is anybody um, doing any consulting to other businesses about their accounting or ERP software? Does anybody do this sometimes? No? Okay. So these are both great opportunities. So whether you use it yourself or whether you sell it to other people, um, you can do this with free software. Um, Postbooks is not the only free solution that you can use as well, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, who thinks it's a good idea to have their financial accounting data stored in a SQL backend? Is that a good idea? So many of the smaller um, packages you can find out there and many of the commercial products for home use don't give you a SQL backend. Um, so this is one exciting thing about using free software is that in the um, proprietary domain, many of the solutions that let you use a SQL backend are a lot more expensive and yet they're not available for use at home unless you pay a lot of money for them. Um, so a little bit about um, Xtuple and Postbooks. Xtuple is the company that makes Postbooks. They also make Xtuple Enterprise and some other things that are not free software um, that they sell and support. Um, but Postbooks is a complete solution um, that it is free software that you can run and modify under a free software license. They use a CPAL as their license. It's one that you may not be familiar with. Um, the basic thing about the CPAL license is it's a bit like a Mozilla license, but it says that you have to put the name of the original author very prominently on anything you distribute. So you always have to put Xtuple on any derivative works uh, in a very prominent way. Um, it does accounting and ERP. So ERP means you can do a lot of other business management tasks, basically. Um, it was originally developed in the US, but now they've generalized it to work in other countries. So instead of using the word check, spelt the American way, they now use the word payment. Um, they support other languages and things like this. Um, it's particularly strong for manufacturing and distribution businesses. So that's probably a good thing here in Germany where manufacturing is a big thing. Um, a little bit about myself and my involvement with Postbooks. Um, so I'm a software engineer. Um, I have a lot of experience of um, financial software, systems administration, networking, various things. You can find out about all of them on my blog. Um, I'm a Debian developer. I also maintain packages in Ubuntu and Fedora. Um, I maintain the Postbooks packages in all of those Linux distributions on a voluntary basis. Um, because for the final point is that I'm using it myself and it's very convenient to have it packaged and to have other people using it and to get their feedback about issues and to also help in maintaining it. Um, so a little bit about accounting. So who is not familiar with double entry accounting? Who doesn't know what I mean? Okay, so we'll break it down in very simple terms. In all software, you've got inputs and you've got outputs. So in an accounting system, the inputs are your bills, um, checks that you've written, bank statements, uh, receipts that people have given you. These are all things you can input into the computer. Um, the outputs might be instructions to pay a check. So if you put in a bill a month ago, then now you have to write the check or send the payment to pay that bill. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. Um, and reports, things like your balance sheet or your profit and loss statement. Um, if you're self-employed, you might have to make a VAT 
return or some other reports from time to time. Um, the benefits of using a double entry accounting system. Has anyone ever paid a bill twice? No? Okay. Um, th this is a problem that some people have, especially if there is more than one person involved in, in running the books. So if you're in a non-profit or a small community organization and you've got a couple of volunteers, two different people might accidentally pay the same bill. This type of software helps you avoid that. Um, you can also track who has not paid you. So if you're self-employed, you're invoicing people, um, and you're really concentrating on doing the best job you can, you don't want to be constantly looking through your bank account and working out um, you know, if someone owes you money. So the software helps you to see that. And if someone hasn't paid you and they're like 40 or 50 days overdue, it will help you see that very quickly. Um, the reports, things like your balance sheet and profit and loss, they help you understand the big picture and to see if you're getting richer or poorer. They let you see risks like big debts appearing in your balance sheet um, at a glance in just a few seconds. Um, so double entry accounting looks a bit like this. You have debits and credits um, and in a typical journal entry they should all add up. You have at least one debit, at least one credit and the values of the debits and the credits should be equal. So in this example, we've sold a product for 108 euro, um, and that's gone into the accounts receivable because the customer hasn't paid us yet. Um, so 100 euro is tracked as income from selling that product, so that's our money to keep, and 8 euro is the tax from that sale, and that's a liability now because that's money we have to hang on to and give to the tax collector at the end of the quarter. Um, so the software helps you keep track of little things like that so that you'll keep that money safely in your bank account to pay that tax bill on time. Um, I made a blog a few months ago comparing many of the free software solutions. Um, I won't go through this table in detail right now because this is a lightning talk, um, but please look at for my blog comparing um, free software accounting solutions. If you're um, using it for personal use, you might find some of the smaller solutions are more appropriate for your needs. Um, if you're looking at something you can sell to businesses, then you might choose a different product from that table. Um, a big topic today is web-based accounting. Um, many of the business solutions offer a web interface. Um, the benefit of a web interface is that you often have bookkeepers and accountants who work for many different businesses. Um, and they can't install every version of the software that every customer is using on the same computer. Uh, using a web interface, they could log into their customers' accounts, even if each customer is using a different system. Um, on the other hand, if you've got a, a full desktop interface, and Postbooks has a Qt-based client, um, then you can have multiple windows, you can have more advanced widgets and controls for um, you know, uh, manipulating your data and, and inspecting your data. Um, this is a look at the Postbooks architecture. Um, so you've got the GUI as the client application and you've got PostgreSQL as the server. A very basic client-server architecture. No other server is needed unless you want to offer the web service to some of your users. Then you need to run a web server, but that's optional. That's off to the right of this picture. Um, you can install the Postgres and the uh, Qt client on a laptop like this and run it wherever you go, or you can be running the Postgres on a server in a data center and people connect to it over a WAN. Um, uh, one of the things I mentioned before is the packages. So this is what I've been doing with Postbooks, is packaging it. On Debian, you can apt-get install Postbooks, as I've demonstrated there. Um, on the client machine, use the first command to install the client application. On your PostgreSQL server, you use the second command, and that will install the schema and the PostgreSQL server. So everything is packaged. Um, there are three different schemas available, a demo, um, a quick start, and an empty schema for people who want to build it all up manually. Um, so I'll give a quick demo. I've taken screenshots so I can do it really quickly. Um, this is the login screen. Um, this is the main screen when you've logged in. 
This is the um, trial balance. Does anyone know what a trial balance is? Okay, if you're showing it to a business user or an accountant or a bookkeeper, this is probably one of the first things they'll ask to see is the trial balance. Um, this is from the demo database. Um, and this is digging down into that trial balance to see some of those transactions. So what next? Try the packages, explore the demo database. Um, you, if you're interested in this type of thing, you can contribute through GitHub, you can contribute to the packaging effort. Um, if you can help internationalize, uh, that would be very welcome. Um, and to help potential users to compare um, free software solutions for their business accounting. Um, Postbooks is a good example. Triton is another popular example. Has anyone heard of Triton? Um, so it's based on the open ERP, um, but it's a more free fork of the project. Um, a quick plug for Conservancy. Uh, software Freedom Conservancy has been raising funds to enhance accounting for non-profit organizations, like many of the free software organizations participating here. Um, they've just hired someone who's actually starting to work on that project. Um, if anyone has experience they'd like to contribute to that, please have a look at their web page and join their mailing list. Um, that's really exciting stuff. A lot of the non-profit organizations actually help participants to come to events like this and code. Um, and give talks and things like that. So anything that improves that work for reimbursement, which is what they're focusing on right now, um, makes everything run a lot more smoothly in the world of free software. So I can't um, overestimate how important this is. Um, so accounting and software freedom. Um, this is my final point. Um, every business needs an accounting system. It's a lowest common denominator, whether it's an arms company or a tobacco company, or whether it's a, like a pharmaceutical company or a, um, a political organization or, or whatever. They all have accounting systems. Um, changing systems is a big effort, so they rarely do it. If someone gets started with a free software solution, then they're going to grow with that and they'll keep using it for years. And that will build confidence in the whole free software ecosystem. Once they've, they've trusted a free software to look after their money, it'll be much easier to offer them other free software solutions as well. So thanks for coming, and yeah, I think that's it for the day. So, yeah.